Hi, I'm Kent Myers and welcome to The Verdict. Uh, as you can see from the set, uh, my partner Mick Cornett is not here today. He's out doing some city business and I trust uh, looking after the interests of Oklahoma City in a, in a great way as he always does. And we'll try to make it along through this show without Mick, but I promise you he'll be back. This is just a temporary absence on his part. Today we're going to be talking about the November 6 elections, the November 06 elections that are going to come forth in Oklahoma with some pretty interesting uh, races developing, a lot of political musical chairs taking place. Some candidates are uh, leaving one office to seek another. Uh, others uh, are talking about staying where they are, but maybe looking at other places to go. It should be a fascinating time, and we've brought to you this morning the fellow that knows more about it than anybody, Mike McCarville. We'll talk to him in just a minute. So please stay with us while our sponsors get a chance to talk to you and come back. You're watching The Verdict. For one Oklahoma-based company, success didn't happen overnight. Initially, the days were long, 80-hour weeks common. As we grew, we wanted to share our success, and the ideals of corporate and civic responsibility found a welcome home. Today, we're the largest investor in the Sooner State, and a source for exciting, new, high-quality jobs. We're Chesapeake Energy, committed to building a better Oklahoma. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Hi, I'm Court Diffney. With all of the change that has taken place in the car industry in the past decade here in Oklahoma, it's hard to find a family-run business anymore. One of the things that makes us different is that if you visit any one of our three locations, you're going to find one of our family members there ready to help you. Does that really make any difference? We really believe it does. So I invite you to come out and experience the Diffie family difference and decide for yourself. Welcome back to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers. As I indicated in the opening, Mick's not here today, but we'll be back soon. Uh, we are really pleased today to have as our guest Mike McCarville. Mike is a longtime Oklahoma political analyst and... Careful uh, on that long time stuff. A well, man of my years, you know, I get a little sensitive about that, Kent. We'll be gentle about it. <laughs> Thank I you, can sir. certainly identify with that. Uh, he is a host of Open Mic Live on KTOK, is also the program director of Open Mic Live. And he has had much uh, experience uh, dealing with political campaigns, political candidates, political questions. And we've asked him to come uh, talk to us this morning about just kind of what's going on in the, in the political scene in Oklahoma, the musical chairs that's uh, taking place in the political arena. Mike, thanks for coming back. Ken, it's my pleasure. And i got to tell you, it's, you know, two months ago we were saying, eh, 2006 is going to be a snoozer of a political year. Mm -hmm. And here we are, as we said here in October, and we're looking at, at races for seats that we thought were going to be shoe-ins and no-brainers uh, next year, and uh, it's, uh, it's topsy-turvy. And every newspaper brings a new announcement of somebody dropping out, almost, standing Almost in. every day someone is announcing, getting ready to announce, or you hear rumors that someone else is getting ready to announce. Well, I want to talk about the, the governor's race okay. to start off with, and let's talk about the, in, the incumbent that nobody thinks uh, uh, two months ago was beatable. Uh, Brad Henry. Yes. Uh, we uh, see that, uh, I guess uh, it's safe to say on the Democratic side, there's not likely to be a serious candidate. I think that would be uh, an apt description of uh, the, yeah, that, well, that side of the aisle. Focus on Governor Henry's uh, term so far and uh, what you see that he's done or hasn't done, perhaps, and talk about his strengths to the electorate. What's he going to try to play up and emphasize as uh, strengths. Well, I, I think first, uh, Kent, we need to examine uh, where Governor Henry is right now, what he's done in his first uh, three years in office. Uh, obviously, he's done something right. 
astronomical approval ratings in any statewide poll you want to look at, 70 up to 73 uh, percent. For a guy in his third year as uh, the leader of the state, that's pretty heady stuff. Uh, there are those, however, who say, and uh, the chairman of the Oklahoma Republican Party, Gary Jones, chief among them, who said, now wait a minute, that's inch died, inch w in, in, uh, mile wide, inch deep. There's just, there's not much substance there. And we hear these nicknames being thrown around Governor Late because of uh, he's uh, occasionally late for events, Governor Light, because they say he hasn't done a lot of things. The gambling gover governor, another uh, uh, name being thrown at him because of uh, the lottery and the gaming initiatives in the state on his watch. Uh, the bottom line to me is in his first three years, uh, Brad Henry has been very, I think, very circumspect. We went through a period of time with Frank Keating where you, you wondered what he was going to say next and stir up controversy with his language. You watch Brad Henry, you don't see any of that. There is, I cannot think of a single controversy inspired by his rhetoric in the last three years. So he hasn't become a lightning rod for a lot of criticism in that sense. And, and to me, that's a strength and in some ways a weakness because a lot of people say, oh, he's laying behind the log. He's afraid he'll put his foot in his mouth. Well, I'm not sure that's it. I think that's just his personality. That's how the guy is put together. Uh, he where has, is he vulnerable? Well, where is he vulnerable? I think uh, the gambling initiatives, uh, the lottery, he could be vulnerable to attack if the lottery, that's just getting underway, if the lottery falls on its face for whatever reason, if there's a lot of controversy, uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, wrongdoing associated with it in the long run, and I'm not saying there's going to be, I'm just saying there's that possibility. Uh, but in, in, in a way, that's a positive for him as well, uh, because uh, he, it's the lottery for education. As he said, he campaigned on it in 2002. Uh, he pushed for its approval in 2004, uh, and uh, here we are with the, with the lottery just getting underway. And if the lottery generates a whole lot of money for education, he'll probably look pretty good. If, on the other hand, the, the, the projections fall on their face and there's not a whole lot of money generated, then I think he may have a problem. Let's look at the Republican side. The okay. first name that comes to mind, for me at least, is Ernest Iztook. The big domino, as I call him these days. Well, I mean, <laughs> think about it. It is the big domino, Iztook deciding to run for governor instead of for Congress, that created all of this other political action we're seeing, and it's everywhere. Yeah, thank you, uh, Congressman Iztook, for this <laughs> show. <laughs> yes, thank we you very much. We wouldn't have had this show, but... Well, the there would have been domino. no need. As I said, <laughs> it was right. going to be uh, a snoozer next year. Uh, but, uh, I mean, his decision uh, to run for governor and, and, and opt out, if you uh, it will, uh, Kent, of a very, he could have been in Congress the rest of his life. Yeah, some people have said that's the safest seat in Congress. Well, I, I certainly would think so. He's demonstrated that time and time again, uh, being reelected uh, every two years, uh, it seems like forever now. Yeah. That's not the case. Uh, so, I mean, he's got a lot riding on this race, and I think he's going to be a very aggressive uh, campaigner. He always has been. Uh, and I, I think he's articulate. Oh, he is very articulate, uh, and he is uh, he he is very much a, 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 a fist in a hand kind of guy. I mean, when he gets going, when he gets wound up, is took can be a very effective uh, stump campaign guy. I mean, you know, he can really deliver a, a speech uh, off the cuff. Now he has you know, his troubles, at least recently, in, in among his own congressional delegation in, in Congress about some funding for roads and the like did he Oh not? yeah and I, I think to me to me that's part of uh, Istook's appeal to a lot of people is that he's perceived as a if, if there's if there is such a phrase kind of a responsible maverick uh, here's a guy who thinks for himself uh, doesn't follow the necessarily the party line all the time uh, but uh, by I mean he goes around bragging about everything he's done for Oklahoma City and the federal funds he's been able to bring in uh, and that kind of thing uh, now, the question I have is, how is he going to wage a campaign against uh, a popular incumbent? We've got to assume the governor's still going to be popular six, eight months from now when this campaign really gets underway, uh, and the points of attack that is took might uh, take. Uh, Looks like he's starting out with perhaps the uh, Indian compacts with the state. Oh, yeah, obviously, and I think he's already touched on the, the lottery issue, as I've already yep. mentioned, and I think he's already started in on, uh, on Henry, the, the governor, uh, whom, in Istook's opinion, doesn't work too hard, doesn't get up early in the morning, this governor late thing, the governor <laughs> light thing. Uh, and so I think we may see uh, some positioning by the governor and the members of his staff and later on his campaign people uh, to kind of knock that down. But it, the dynamic of this race, I, I think, is going to be very interesting to watch unfold. Let me ask you this. Uh, <clears throat> we're almost... Uh, uh, it's a little more interesting even to talk about the people that aren't in the race. <laughs> Early on, uh, there was a lot of talk about J.C. Watts, 
a former congressman and the well-known Oklahoma quarterback Absolutely. and the like, yeah. uh, jumping into the race, very popular, I think, and he stepped away, said, nope, not for me. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon did substantially the same, same thing. thing. Uh, one wondered if, if the Republicans were going to field a candidate. Were you surprised that Istook said, let it be me? I, I was, just, just because of the safeness of the seat in Congress uh, and the fact that the Istook took a serious look at the Senate race a couple of years back and then decided not to get into it. Uh, but, but the word started going out uh, among Istook supporters that, hey, He's really serious this time. Uh, his wife, Judy, is going to meetings with him. Uh, and B, he's even having meetings. Uh, and considering the Senate race, he didn't have any meetings. Talked to some people on the telephone, but this time he was pulling Republican legislators together saying, can I count on your support? And that, I think, was the real indicator of how serious he was this time around. Let me ask you about two other candidates real quickly. Uh, Bob Sullivan from Tulsa and Senator Jim Will Williamson from Tulsa. No names in terms of statewide name identification. I mean, nobody knows who Bob Sullivan is. Very few know who Senator uh, Williamson is. Uh, they're going to have uh, tough roads to hoe. Now, uh, Sullivan is a very wealthy man, my understanding, uh, and purportedly is willing to spend a lot of his own money. Now, a lot of money can make a whole lot of difference in your name identification on a statewide basis. So Sullivan may turn out kind of to be a sleeper uh, candidate, and uh, but 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 he's. He's un, I mean, has no identity with the Republican voters uh, or with the, the electorate at large. Let me jump in here and you get bet. us to a break. Uh, we're visiting with Mike McCarville on the changing Oklahoma political scene. You're watching The Verdict. We'll be right back. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And Blankenship has stopped at the line of scrimmage. No gain on the play. Leading at fourth and seven on the Tiger, 46 yard line. 38 seconds on the clock. The Tigers have no choice but to go ah. Wiggins in to do the kicking. Here's the snap. R.S.M. McGladry. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. R.S.M. McGladry. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311. Welcome back to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers. Uh, Mick Cornett uh, will be back with us soon. He's just missing today. We're visiting with Mike McCarville on the changing political scene. We've talked about the governor's race. I want to switch now, Mike, and talk about the 5th uh, District race, the seat vacated by the big domino, uh, uh, Representative Istook. And a fascinating race it's going to be. It's got, we've got a long list of names to oh talk about. Oh, my goodness. And in no, political, uh, in no particular political order, let's just start out with uh, the current Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon, who on this show uh, several weeks ago said she was just going to stay and be uh, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, now how, quickly, says, how quickly things change, yeah, Kit. They do. Yeah, and, and, and not only that, I mean, Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon set to make her announcement, and then jumping in the afternoon before her is Corporation <laughs> Commissioner Denise Bodie, also a Republican. So think about this. We've got two of the state's uh, top three elected Republican women in the same race for Congress. First time in my knowledge that's ever happened. We've had two Republican women, but never two of the among the state's statewide office holders. And the third one so, uh, lining up with uh, Brenda Denise Brenda Wynn, yeah, 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 lining up uh, with uh, Denise Bodie. Uh, so I, it's going to be fascinating to, to watch this unfold. And that we're, we're going to have other Republicans, I think, jump in. Uh, uh, Fred Morgan, a veteran of the legislature, uh, may jump into it. 
Uh, former yeah, legislator Bill Graves has talked about it. Some people think that Graves, if Morgan gets in, will throw his support to Morgan. Who knows what's going to happen? Now. Well, the, basically the 5th District is Oklahoma County and a little bit west. Now, that's correct, yeah. So we're just talking about people with large name recognition in that geographic that, area. That's true. And uh, I've heard the name Ron Norick bantered about. Former uh, for mayor this. of Oklahoma City. Yes. Uh, I've heard his name uh, speculated about a little bit, but not very much. I guess just because he hadn't been too active in recent years. Uh, but frankly, uh, given the field of uh, Fallon, Bodie, maybe Morgan, uh, uh, maybe uh, Ryan Leonard in Oklahoma City, it, I would be surprised if, uh, if the former mayor got into it myself. Well, um, Denise Bodie, uh, she's like Mary Fallon, was on this show recently and said she was staying where she was. <laughs> um, how do you predict the, uh, the uh, fallout between Mary Fallon and Denise Bodie? Who's going to prevail in that? Oh my goodness! Uh, well, I tell you, in a multi in a multi candidate primary, obviously Fallon and Bodie are the two front runners right now. I mean, if it was hell right now, I'd probably be close to a dead heat. You throw other names into it, say a Fred Morgan or somebody like that, uh, and it's hard for me to envision uh, them uh, getting through the primary without a runoff. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, a lot of things come into play: uh, organizational ability, the fundraising ability, uh, how they've done during the primary process. I would just say right now between Fallon and Bodie, uh, man, toss a coin. I mean, who knows? And of course, let's not overlook the Democrats now. Yeah, let's talk about I mean, about what those. an opportunity mm -hmm. for the Democrats, an open seat in Congress. Uh, and I know the, the Democrats say, well, you know, we've got a chance and uh, maybe old Jack Milton will jump in there. I'm not sure about that. Former uh, Jack, lieutenant governor. Former lieutenant governor and a great guy. Uh, just signed a new deal. He's uh, now doing uh, sports commentary, football, on television and radio. Uh, I just I don't know whether he'd be willing to give that up to run for office. Uh, we've heard Cliff Hudson, the CEO of Sonic, his name mentioned. Uh, I don't know that he's going to do it. He certainly would be a formidable candidate, no yeah, question. President about. of the Oklahoma City School Board. Oh yeah, he would, and and an, a highly respected individual. And uh, for those who don't know him, an absolutely great guy. Uh, we've heard uh, Lou Barlow, who has been run uh, in the past. Yes. Uh, Jim Meyer, a very successful businessman. Uh, apparently uh, fairly well moneyed, could uh, finance his own campaign if he wanted to. Uh, and we're, we're during that period of time, uh, uh, Kent, I think we're, we're going to continue to hear names and how this field is going to shake out. We may know, well, we will absolutely know, at 5 p.m. on the last day of filing next year. That's when we're really going to know how this thing's going to shake out. If you're out. a Republican lobbyist with only a limited budget to, uh, to contribute, uh, what, how do you make these decisions? Oh, my, well, very carefully. <laughs> that, would, that would certainly be, and, and if you're a donor of any kind uh, and you're on the Republican side, I mean, you're looking at Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon, obviously a very uh, 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 successful political career thus far. Denise Bodie, pretty doggone successful political career so mm -hmm. far, statewide office holder, uh, well known for her uh, uh, pro-consumer uh, stances over on the Corporation Commission. Uh, you just, you got to be very, if you're a donor, you got to look at this and be very circumspect. Should be a fascinating race. Oh, I, I, it is going to be. No well, question about it. Let me switch gears one more time sure. with you. Uh, Mary Fallon uh, vacated the lieutenant governor's office. Yes. Which, of course, uh, we'll, we'll vacate it. Yes. Hasn't done it quite yet, but we'll vacate it. Uh, how's that race shaping up? Who do you see jumping in line on the Republican side? possibly for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, House Speaker uh, Todd Hyatt obviously is the first name a lot of Republicans talk about. He's term limited, uh, can't uh, seek re-election, and will go out of office um, uh, next year at yes. 2006. Uh, he's the one most of the Republicans are uh, talking about, uh, almost to the exclusion of everyone else. I mean, a lot of other names get bandied about, but he's the one they're really focused on right now. What about on the Democratic side? Who do you see jumping in there? You know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things I really haven't heard a solid name uh, um, other than Jerry Askins, a state representative from Duncan, who jumped mm -hmm. in, surprised everybody, jumped in right off the whoopee, and no ifs, ands, buts about it, I'm running, and I'm running to win, uh, as a partner to Brad Henry. So there's obviously, she's going to try to make some linkage there. I, again, I think she's a formidable candidate, a uh, hard worker in her campaign. She's earned a reputation of being a a hard campaigner. Now, um, is she the minority leader in the House? Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. And she would have been the first female Speaker of the House if Democrats had retained control. Yeah. So obviously her peers have a lot of confidence in her. Let me do something that uh, is not on this piece of paper. Let's jump back to sure. the governor's race for one name we didn't discuss, Gary Richardson. Yes. Gary Richardson, of course, ran as an independent. A lot of people say, oh, that nasty Richardson, he's the one that cost Steve Largent the governor's office because he got into it 
and he siphoned votes off of Steve Largent. Well, Brad Henry says, hey, all of our exit polls showed he siphoned uh, as many or more votes off me as he did off Largent. I don't buy into that. I think uh, Richardson did hurt Largent. Richardson, a former Republican who turned independent to make that race and spent $2 million of his own money, very successful trial lawyer in Tulsa, now talking about making the race as a Republican. I think he may do it just because he wants to, uh, but I have a hard time believing that Republican uh, uh, voters would nominate him. Let's uh, change away from the political uh, 06 elections and, and let's look back a little bit on what's happened so far since Tom Coburn got elected to the United States Senate. <laughs> okay. Give, give us your analysis of Coburn's, Coburn's performance so far. Senator Maverick is alive and well in Washington. <laughs> uh, Tom Coburn, when he was a member of Congress, uh, uh, during his uh, six years, his three terms there, uh, became known as a maverick uh, in uh, fiscal issues, on, on other issues, and uh, he certainly has not changed his tune, has he? Uh, much to the consternation, I might add, of a lot of his fellow Republican members of the Senate, uh, and he said some things um, that uh, have uh, angered the other, including his fellow U.S. Senator from Oklahoma, Jim Inhofe, uh, and angered a lot of his fellow members of the Senate, and, of course, this, this means in the long term how effective can Senator Coburn uh, be uh, as a member of the Senate. Well, I think it can be pretty effective, and a lot of people feel that, hey, this is just the kind of guy we need up there who just, okay, he's a doctor, and, yeah, he's got money, and, yeah, he's a member of that elite club, but, by golly, he speaks for me. And then there are others who say, oh, please. Don't do the crossword get, puzzles. <clears throat> tell him to get on the team. I mean, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah, don't do the crossword puzzles during the confirmation hearing. Well, we'll watch that uh, with interest. Mike, we've got to uh, break it off right here to uh, get to another break. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Ken. It's always a pleasure. A pleasure. Uh, we've been visiting with Mike McCarville, the uh, chief political analyst uh, here in Oklahoma, at least my chief political analyst, and uh, we're, you're watching The Verdict. We'll be back in just about two minutes. That land next door was a mess. Take more than a lawnmower to revive that land. I heard the oil and natural gas people was cleaning up old oil sites, and it wouldn't cost us a flood nickel. Oh, yes, sir, it was quite a revival. The whole church showed up, want to make a playground for the kids. <laughs> it sure is a blessing. Bringing out the best in each student, that is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities, parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. Welcome back to The Verdict. Kent Myers closing up the show. Uh, we will look forward to Mick Cornett uh, joining us again uh, soon. Uh, thanks to Mike McCarville for coming and visiting with us about the upcoming political uh, elections in 06 and a lot of the uh, dominoes that are falling and offices that are opening up and candidates uh, running to uh, try to fill those offices. Uh, this next show uh, that we're going to give you is about uh, Bob Burke, Oklahoma's biographer laureate. Uh, Bob is an attorney, uh, a historian, a writer who has written more political and non-political, non-fiction books than anybody ever. And he will be our guest discussing some of his writing techniques, subjects, and the like. I think you'll find it interesting. Join us. And if you have an idea for us, check us out on TheVerdict.tv. Uh, for Mick Cornett, I'm Kent Myers. We will see you next week.
The preceding program was produced by the Production Services Group at Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel.